In 1834, three daughters of a Yorkshire parson sat for their portrait. The artist was their brother, and his painting is now a unique record of the world's most famous literary sisters. Charlotte, who gave us Jane Eyre, Anne, who wrote The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, and Emily, the author of Wuthering Heights, books which instantly took the world by storm and remain some of the best loved in the English language. The most important influence on their lives was their father, Patrick, who shaped their minds and shared their triumphs, but also lived to see their tragic deaths. There can be no greater sorrow for any father than to see his children taken from him one by one. Yet while I will mourn their loss forever, God daily grants me the comfort to look back upon their genius with pride. This is the extraordinary story of the ill-fated but gifted Brontes. of Haworth Moor in the West Riding of Yorkshire stands Haworth Church. Beside the churchyard lies the quiet grey stone parsonage which was the Bronte home. This was the landscape that cradled their emotional and creative lives. Patrick Bronte first brought his young family to Haworth on a cold February day in 1820. His wife Maria, the six Bronte children and all their possessions travelled on a borrowed farm wagon. The oldest child, also named Maria, was just six. Then came Elizabeth and Charlotte, Branwell the only boy and Emily. The baby Anne was just a month old. Patrick Bronte was the brilliant son of a poor Irish farmer. He clawed his way up to win a scholarship to Cambridge and to become a clergyman. Not a wealthy man, this was the grandest house that his family had ever lived in. The children were entranced by everything they saw and immediately fell in love with the parsonage, none more so than Emily. What is he, Emily? What is he? Even as an adult, Emily would be overwhelmed with homesickness whenever she was forced to be away from the parsonage and poured her feelings into her poetry. The house is old, the trees are bare, and moonless bends the misty dome. But what on earth is half so fair, so longed for, as the hearth of home? In their writing, the Brontes describe Haworth as a romantic moorland village. In fact, beyond the churchyard walls, Haworth was a grimy mill town in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, paying the price for progress. When the Brontes first arrived, the main water supply for the town was so polluted that even the cattle refused to drink it. Disease and poverty meant that almost half of Haworth's children died before they were six and the average life expectancy was 25. Early I say unto you, 
In his hurry to save souls, Patrick Bronte regularly baptized whole families in batches of up to 30 a day. It's the congregation of Christ's flock, and we name them the sign of the cross. But it wasn't just their spiritual welfare that concerned him. He campaigned tirelessly to improve the living conditions that posed such a threat to his needy parish. I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son. But despite his dedication to his flock, there were some in the town who thought the new Irish parson a little eccentric. Behind the high garden walls of the parsonage, Patrick and Maria sheltered the children from the poverty of the town. They were devoted to their young family and to each other. Theirs was a love match, and during their courtship and marriage, Patrick wrote and published several poems to his wife. Maria, let us walk and breathe the morning air and hear the cuckoo sing, and every tuneful bird that woos the gentle spring. The primrose pale, the modest daisy, and the violet blue, inviting spread their charms for you. How much enhanced is all this bliss to me, since it is shared in mutual joy with thee. Our marriage was happy. But all too brief. Just a few months after we arrived here at the parsonage, my dear wife Maria became very sick. Maria's sister, Elizabeth Bramwell, came to nurse her. Oh, Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Our only hope in time of need, we fly unto thee for succor on behalf of this thy poor servant, here lying under thy hand in great weakness of body. Look graciously upon her, O oh Lord. Oh God, our children. She suffered for seven months and then died. If not triumphantly, at least calmly. I was now a stranger in a strange land with six motherless children. Little Maria and Elizabeth did their best to comfort the younger children, but this loss would haunt them all for the rest of their lives. The lost mother would become a recurring theme in Charlotte's novels, and as an adult, she struggled to recall the image of the mother she had known so briefly. I have only two or three sad, sweet memories of my mother, including one of her playing with Branwell in the parlor one evening. I wish that she had lived and that I had known the mind from which my own had sprung. Maria's sister, known to the family as Aunt Bramwell, stayed on to help with the children. But she missed the warmth of her native Penzance, and to everyone's amusement, insisted on wearing her winter overshoes inside the house to protect her feet from the cold stone floors. She was a good woman, did her best. But the children lacked a mother's guiding hand. 